Love it or hate it, Love actually got something right, because every year as the days get shorter and the high street gets crazier, it tops the list of the UK's most popular Christmas films. Released at the dawning of internet criticism, a generation of writers has cut their teeth with hot takes about how much they hate this movie actually, and how it's shit actually. It's a sanitized version of Mont Britain, it's anti-fat, it's anti-women, it shows people happy at Heathrow, which never happens. Worst of all, it's, say it with me now, PROBLEMATIC. <laughs> On the off chance that you're watching a video essay about Love Actually but you haven't actually seen it, here's the plot. Set in the posh part of London in the weeks leading up to Christmas, the film follows nine intertwined stories that broadly explore the theme of love. There's a newly elected Prime Minister who falls for a junior staffer, a graphic designer whose family responsibilities complicate her love life, a middle-aged man whose attraction to his new secretary leads him to betray his wife, an aging rock star coming to terms with his lack of meaningful relationships, a love triangle, an author falling for his cleaner, a grieving father and son, two nude body doubles, and a man so repulsive that he has to leave the country to get laid. Here comes Colin Frizzle, and he's got a big knob. Written and directed by New Zealand-born Brit Richard Curtis, the film was released at the tail end of a spectacular era for Curtis and British pop culture. During the 90s, the UK experienced economic growth, artistic innovation, and a political swing to the left. Britpop ruled the airwaves, sports got a glow up thanks to David Beckham, and the mood pre-9-11, I'm told, was optimistic. British cinema also got a makeover. Internationally, it was mostly known for period dramas about horny rich people shooting pain glances at each other across large country homes. But the success of The Full Monty, Billy Elliot, Train Spotting, Notting Hill, and Four Weddings and a Funeral, the latter two penned by Curtis, loosened up British cinema's stuffy image. Four Weddings earned Curtis an Oscar nomination for Best Screenplay. The award went to Pulp Fiction, but that film gave him an idea. He told EW in 2017, I was such a great fan of Pulp Fiction, Robert Altman's films, Woody Allen's films. Those movies with multiple storylines that crisscross each other. Wouldn't it be great to have only the best scenes instead of having to trudge through the other stuff? That's right. Love Actually was partly inspired by Pulp Fiction. So he wrote a script which was basically the greatest hits compilation of romantic tropes. Curtis has also said that the film is, quote, not about people in love, but love itself, what love sort of means, about the subject rather than one example of a story about the subject. The movie's structure leaves little room for nuance. Moments of tension and conflict are given just enough time to land and then immediately undercut by moments of comedy. The fast pace also lends the film a lightness of touch, so it's not a particularly demanding watch, which is what makes it perfect for the sensory overload that is the Christmas season. The limited time spent on each story also necessitates a reliance on broad gestures, and if you find these charming, then it's probably because the actors perform them with such complete sincerity. There's no eye rolling, there's no archness, there's no wink wink aunt rom com silly. The film has plenty of space for sincerity and joy. And with each narrative development, the music is right there to tell you exactly how to feel. The scenarios in this film are heightened and ridiculous, but the sentiments expressed are familiar to anyone who's ever had a crush. With a star-studded cast, the soundtrack stuffed with hits, and not a single trace of cynicism or pretension, Love actually opened in UK cinemas in November 2003 to mixed reviews but solid box office. It peaked at number 6 in the UK, grossed 246 million US dollars worldwide on a 45 million dollar budget. It then spent the next decade doing respectable business on TV reruns, DVD sales and rentals and generally not offending anyone. Meanwhile, the internet exploded. In the mid 2000s, the price of broadband began to fall. Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram all launched, and the internet went from being something that you accessed only at school or at work via slow dial up internet connections to being contained in the palm of your hand. One of the many results of this growth was the emergence of the attention economy and the emergence of a style of journalism that I like to call BuzzFeed voice. You know it. I did a verb, and now I have a feeling. Neutral statement, provocative follow up. Print media was dying, and digital media companies discovered that they could make bank with something called a viral hit. One way that seemed to work really well was taking something innocuous from the recent past that a lot of people have an emotional connection to, and telling them that they were wrong to like it. The internet also opened the door for conversations about pop culture that are important and constructive, and it's also given opportunities to a more diverse range of critics, writers, and creatives. But it also created an environment that rewards provocation, and starting in the 2010s, 
Nuance often lost out to hyperbole in the search for viral hits. In 2013, feminist website Jezebel hit the mother load with this. An article by American writer, comedian, and activist Lindy West headlined, I rewatched Love Actually and am here to ruin it for all of you. Neutral statement, provocative follow up. The article detailed the many, many strong reactions that Lindy had while rewatching Love Actually, and it also launched the I Hate Love Actually industrial complex. The tone of this article and much of the internet of the 2010s can best be described as hyperbolic rage. We open in a fing airport. A fing airport! Of course, Love Actually, the apex of cynically vacant, faux emotional, cash grab, garbage cinema, would hang its big metaphor on the bleak, empathy stripped cathedral of turgid bureaucracy known as the airport. She's not wrong. The movie opens with a reference to 9 11 that, even 20 years later, it's like nails on a chalkboard. She makes a lot of very valid criticisms, pointing out the film's unnecessary fat jokes, the female character's lack of agency, the anachronism of having a Portuguese-speaking village in France. Lindy West is a talented writer, and the article is searing and hilarious, and I'm pretty sure it's satire. It went viral, and much like the film it's about, inspired a thousand imitators with diminishing returns. Every. Single. Christmas. A lot of them focus on things that love actually can genuinely be criticized for. The lack of racial diversity in London, no less. The focus on male desire, the absence of any queer relationships. Curtis himself admitted in 2022 that the lack of diversity now makes him feel uncomfortable. But I'm not sure that the film's reputation as a saccharine fantasy or an endorsement of toxic behavior is entirely warranted. For one thing, the film doesn't shy away from the painful side effects of love. We see a father and son reconnecting after a tragic death an aging boomer rock star learning to let himself be open and vulnerable, Emma Thompson crying in her bedroom because, although she has everything she could possibly need or want, her lovely life is about to fall apart. Even the storyline which I think is the weakest, Colin the Sex Tourist, is just about palatable because it is so clearly a satire of the idea that Americans automatically find Britishness charming and quirky. What, what do you call that? Uh, bottle. Bottle. <laughs> An idea popularized by Richard Curtis Films. I feel like these articles say more about the internet's tendency to cannibalize its greatest hits than it does about the quality of the actual film. It's totally fine to not like Love Actually. No one's forcing you. You don't have to like anything. The film contains nine stories and not all of them are gonna land. I personally struggle with the scene where the fake British PM is telling fake George Bush that their country's relationship had become, quote, a bad one, because it reminds me of the time that the real British PM didn't do that, and then thousands of people in the country where I'm from were killed and displaced. You might feel strongly about a different scene. That's fine. But the genius of this film is that there's not enough time to linger on anything that's particularly objectionable. One minute, I'm being triggered by fake Tony Blair. The next, I'm gritting my teeth as I watch Emma Thompson gleefully unwrap a Pandora's box on her marriage. The pacing definitely works in the film's favor, and it's probably why its most widely imitated and controversial scenes kind of works. Listen, the way that this guy goes about finding closure is definitely creepy. But the scene works because in this jam-packed Christmas stocking of a film, we don't see enough of Peter and Juliet's relationship to form an attachment to them as a couple, so the betrayal isn't foregrounded. Am I basically saying that this scene and this film as a whole works if you don't think too hard about it? Welcome to the rom-com, where social rules are often broken in service of dramatic tension and catharsis, and crucially, it is fiction designed to elicit emotion and not a manual for how to conduct yourself. I think one thing that got lost in the 2010s hot take boom was the distinction between depiction and endorsement. If this happened in real life, I would be concerned for everyone involved. But watching it from the comfort of my living room within the confines of a three-act structure and with a glass of wine? I won't lie, it's kind of hot. The annual takedowns don't seem to have affected Love Actually's popularity, and after 20 years, I think we can safely call it a Christmas classic. And that's the point. These articles only get published because the film is popular, and websites need to publish SEO articles to drive engagement on their platforms. But in the year of our Lord 2023, is it still necessary to make people feel bad about liking a film that demands so little from the viewer and has the stated intention of showing that, even in dark times, love is all around? 
Are we so suspicious of earnestness that the only acceptable public response to a Christmas themed movie about love is that it's bad actually? I hope not. I'm not saying that the film is beyond reproach, but I do think that there needs to be more space to appreciate film, TV and music, especially those that were made in the past, and discuss their shortcomings without dismissing the work and its fan base entirely. So as Love actually turns 20, I'm hoping that we can retire the lazy bad faith criticism that was born out of the 2010s, make a little room for nuance, and let people enjoy a film that has love as an impetus and Christmas as a unifying theme. Let this be the start of a new era. And <laughs> it's so dumb. No, 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 it's not. <laughs> and. Ha 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 ha!